Before we get going, I want to take a minute just to thank everyone who's here. Um, you're all supporters of Creativity Explored. Um, these have been really challenging times for our organization and for all of us. Um, we all have our struggles and the way that our donors and supporters and partners have showed up for us during this time um, is really nothing short of miraculous. Um, we have been able to sustain the work that we do um, and really hold this community together um, with your support. Um, we have been able to retain um, over 95% of our staff, um, continue providing uh, all kinds of services, um, mostly virtually or through mail or deliveries or phone calls um, to Creativity Explored artists. Um, and those services are not only a way to help um, keep creativity alive in the lives of CE artists, but they're also a lifeline of um, support, camaraderie, community, um, and continuing to maintain um, maintain that community during when times get hard. Um, so we're very, very grateful. And I see some CE artists here tonight. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. Um, and um, yeah, I want to, without further ado, also ask you to um, mark your calendars for April 23rd. Um, that's when we're going to be holding a virtual version of our Art Changes Lives Gala. And we're excited about sharing more information about that with you as the months roll on. Um, and also, if you haven't yet visited our new website, um, we think you're going to be really excited and surprised when you check it out. Um, it's very alive, vibrant, um, and really easy to, um, to shop from and, and view artwork. Um, so please uh, take a look. Maybe Megan can put the URL in the chat just in case somebody doesn't have it um, because it's a, it's a really delightful um, and dynamic um, website that we really feel is worthy of our work. Um, so again, I wanna say a huge thank you to you, to all of you. And I wanna introduce Ann Kappas, who is not only our um, Director of Art Partnerships, but she is also our curator um, for this show. Welcome, Ann. Thank you, Linda, for that great introduction. And so great to see so many people here. Thanks so much. And we're really excited to be celebrating Ana Maria and her work tonight. So um, let's, uh, next slide, please. For I'm just gonna, we're gonna dive right into giving an introduction. I thought we'd start with just talking about um, Ana Maria herself. Um, let's hold on one moment. I just wanna do one thing here. Yeah, so I, um, going to Ana Maria's slide. Um, there we go. The next one. Thank you so much. So just thought we'd start off with introducing you to Ana Maria um, and why I was interested in like promoting her work. Um, basically, uh, un unfortunately for us, Ana Maria is not able to join us for the, you know, in person or virtually for, for this event. We would usually love to have the artists included in a, in a topic, in a conversation like this, but um, from what I understand, and um, our, a lot of our staff has been in touch with Ana Maria and her family, but from what we understand, she and her family are not as comfortable just communicating via technology. And so therefore our interactions with her, especially during COVID have been a little bit limited. And that's actually the case with a few artists who have limited capabilities in terms of technology, which we at Creative Sport have, have made great strides in, in providing that uh, uh, products and things to help people connect. But in some cases, people just choose to, they don't, they're not comfortable or for whatever reason don't want to communicate via some technology. So we do, we are in touch frequently. And um, during COVID, Ana Maria has just been, you know, not has, has not been working in the program as much, but rest assured that Pilar Olabria, who is our studio, um, kind of a, our services provider and also one of her teachers is actually, uh, it's great. We're communicating with you all virtually showing you the exhibit virtually. And then Ana Maria is actually getting physical photographs being sent to her via the mail. So, and that's what her preferred way of receiving um, the information about the show was. So it's kind of nice that we're seeing this come full circle about how we're communicating the show. Um, 
But back to Ana Maria, basically in you know, her almost 30 year tenure at CE, she's actually taken a lot of temporary leaves from the program to travel to her native Peru. So the fact that we're not in touch with her as often or seeing her as often is kind of apropos because sometimes she'll, she's actually taken like a year off the program. And, and But rest, every time, as everyone who's ever worked with Ana Maria has said, that, you know, we're always ecstatic when she returns. <clears throat> she is a Spanish speaker. Um, um, Ana Maria is a Spanish speaker with kind of limited communication abilities. One of her teachers and well-known artist himself, Victor Cartagena, has worked closely with Villan for about a, a dozen years now. And he told me that it's, it actually took him several, many years to understand Villan's unique singular use of Spanish. Um, and the way he said something, I'm quoting from him, kind of the way her brain waves, weaves words together in a really quick, uh, kind of unique and poetic or musical way. It's actually reflected in her work and you see, you'll see you see that a lot. Um, he added that you really kind of need to pay attention and um, but she often strings so many words together. It's a really unique language that he's been, he said he's been just um, honored to, to learn and, and to communicate more and more with her as the years have gone by. One last thing about Vinlon before we go on to the actual work in the show is that um, she does comprehend everything that's going on around her. If you don't know her very well, you may think that she's kind of not, not quite understanding, but and because she can appear, appear kind of quiet or low key. But once she finds her comfort zone, many of her teachers, colleagues, and fellow artists, um, you know, agree that she will begin talking and will keep talking. <laughs> um, you can't stop her, uh, says Cartagena. Family is incredibly important to Ana Maria, and she often indicates that family members are included in her drawings and paintings, which we'll see in a, in a moment. Um, and finally, uh, Creative Word traditionally presents a solo exhibition every year, um, a solo exhibition of an artist, in, usually in the January period. And so we are so, we're so excited to, and de decided to pay attention to Vidalon's work, and, and we thought it was way overdue. As I said, she's been practicing at CE for almost 30 years. Um, like the title of the exhibit, Vinlon often presents figures in her artworks, but she, um, but she herself, an artist of color, uh, an artist with a disability, and someone who doesn't communicate you know, using more traditional language skills um, is the real hidden figure in the art world today. So the, hopefully the, the meaning has a double layer there. Uh, next slide, please. So just real, uh, why I was introduced to, um, uh, why I was inspired by Ana Maria's work is this is one of the key pieces that kind of has always uh, gotten keen my attention. Um, I've seen Villon working in the studio for many years and have always admired her work, but it's often her abstract kind of musical notes, composition pieces that have always received the most praise. Um, but I was really inspired to present this particular body of her work because it's so mysterious to me. Um, Ana Maria includes um, figures in most of her earlier works dating back about 15 years, which makes up the bulk of the pieces in this exhibition. So all the pieces have what I'm calling these hidden figures, and I don't, you can't see in my cursor, but it's, you'll see the two isolated ones there in the middle. Um, you know, uh, some of the most famous artists has intentionally put secret messages in their paintings, whether it's to subvert authority, challenge audiences, or reveal something about themselves. But what I was, I've always questioned, what are Vidalon's intentions behind adding these tiny, sometimes hidden faces and figures to these dense drawings? Why does she isolate figures and crowd others in this, in this stormy sea of repetitive markings that fill the page? Do these visages, visages represent loved ones, um, strangers, or extended family members from her native Peru? Are they happy, sad? Are they isolated? Are they lonely? Are they, are they what are they expressing? As an artist with varying verbal abilities, we may never actually fully understand why Vidalon creates space for faces and forms within her abstract congested drawings. Outside of her color, her bold color choices and mixes of media, the thing I like most about Vidalon's work is, is especially because of the stories that can be interpreted and it's those can be interpreted differently by each viewer. So, uh, Hidden Figures doesn't intend to answer any of these questions, but merely invites you, the viewer, and everyone else who can see this exhibition um, to take a closer look and just really um, dive into uh, this artist's work who's often overlooked herself. Uh, next slide. Now I'm gonna just take you, since we can't be there in person, unfortunately, but this the great thing about technology is we can, we can 
do a cursor, you know, a cursory view through the gallery. So I'm going to take a quick spin around the gallery and then focus on a few select pieces with their details. And I'm so thrilled to have assistant studio manager and teaching um, artist Eric Larson joining me because he's worked for many years with Vinlon herself as well. And he's going to be adding some comments about her work and her process as we go through. Um, this is the entry to our gallery. And because Vinlon's work has kind of seldom been seen or shown, um, and given adequate attention, it's kind of flown under the radar a lot. And also because COVID has shut down our physical doors, I wanted to make kind of a splash of color um, and provide a large graphic detail of one of the lead images, which you see here on the right. So that whole window is, is covered up with a vinyl that kind of shows a detail of the work. So um, that even if you're behind the gates and you're kind of passing by, you can see her work in a bold way. Um, basically, the, basically the work and our gallery is kind of coming out of a dark cloud of this period of the pandemic and so it seems apropos of the state of affairs to do something bold and big in the new year. Um, next slide please. So in the window, here's the accompanying window where you can see the actual work um, and uh, you know to avoid any additional obstacles of seeing Binlon's work, we actually chose not to frame the pieces but have them shown as they are pure without any kind of you know, even uh, acrylic vinyl or anything without any barriers, basically. And so it's fun to walk by. This is right in the window, so you can see the detail of it, and then you can look to the other window and see a blown up graphic detail. Uh, next slide, please. In the window, I feel like Vidalon's signature itself is kind of a work of art, so it's writ large on the back, back wall. Um, and when you look closely at her works, which we'll do in a moment, you can you can see that her signature almost resembles some of the mark making and the musical notes, flowers and figures and people that she includes in her work. And also kind of conceptually by reprodu reproducing her name in a grand size, it also gives this kind of more marginalized artist a larger standing. Next work. Then when you walk into the gallery, the first thing um, is kind of seeing inside the gallery, we begin, we begin with a splash of color. and. Um, kind of basically what I learned after the fact, after selecting these works and looking through them, um, I wasn't aware of this, but Eric brought this to my attention that uh, I did believe these represented landscapes, but as we'll see later, um, the actual, Eric pointed out that these scenes and their colors pretty much mimic the unique geography of Peru. Uh, next slide. And here's some examples of that, of kind of images of the topography of Peru, which is, I've never been there myself, but it looks fantastic. And you can, I see a lot of this, this um, imagery represented in um, Bidlon's work. Eric, did you want to add something to that? You might have. No, I think you're doing great. And okay. I think it, it does sort of, these images remind me of her work a little bit, so. And then going further into the once going further in the gallery, the, the exhibition is kind of primarily arranged into groupings. Oh, next slide, please. Sorry. Uh, these these two colorful works um, kind of initially invite you in with this bright color, but then they also encourage you to get closer and just kind of search for the figures, the flowers. There's even potentially some animals, but you can see these layered landscapes. Um, and I think it's just as using these bold colors as a way to like get your attention, but then it invites you also to dive closer in with the multiple multiple layers of, of media that she uses. Next slide. Um, we'll go over these in more detail in a moment, but this is a, just another pairing. Again, two landscapes um, continuing on that theme. Next slide. Um, and this is another pairing with these um, kind of the color wash that she adds to the backgrounds, adds like an abstract quality. That's what I really like about the works too. They read as a landscape, but they also read as an abstract piece. And then again, these have a lot of textures in them and we're gonna look at that closer. Um, you can see how Anna Maria's kind of compulsive repetition and rhythm are kind of signatures of her work throughout. And next slide, please. On the back wall, um, color kind of following that colorful introduction and spectrum of her work, uh, we move into kind of a darker uh, series. Um, as I understand it, Anna Maria, when she first started working, she would almost fill the page and it would be very black and white. Then kind of this middle period of her work, which is mostly represented in the, in the exhibition, is a lot of colorful pieces. And, um, and then she's gone back to doing black and white in the last several years. So this is kind of the transition, some of it of transition period, but also shows you that even though some of these pieces are a little bit darker and stark, 
she adds a lot of silver and splashes of color and really craftily and skillfully kind of creates figures and people out of the negative spaces. It's really hard to do that if you've never, if you've ever tried. She doesn't draw an outline and covers around it. She creates the marks and those marks then include a negative space inside there. So it's, I think it's really challenging to do. I've actually tried it since seeing the works. <laughs> uh, next slide, please. Then one of the final pairings is, uh, these are some more recent works that she did with Victor Cartagena as her teacher, kind of mentoring her and providing the resources. They're paired primarily because of their, the borders that she's used, because usually she fills up the space, and also because of their colors. Uh, the piece on the right is a little more unique. It's a quite a rare drawing because in, in this case, her figures are fully formed. They're not just the portrait or the shoulder up like we're seeing on Zoom, which is very appropriate that we're looking at her work, which also is usually from here on up. Um, in this case, a lot of the figures appear to be dancing and they're fully formed. They have legs and the whole, the whole figure. Um, so it's kind of, kind of a unique piece. And then it's contrasted startly, starkly on the left by this piece that's almost more of a wash of color with very faint musical notes in the upper right hand side, which she usually leaves this sweep of, of um, space in a lot of her pieces. Um, and there's some musical notes there that could represent people. It's, it's faintly hints at people. And then uh, next slide, please. And then the final kind of pairing is, uh, is unique in that, again, her signature plays prominently here to mimic the mark making in her works. But also these two pieces are really, um, I thought singular because they're they're so populated um, and we will go into those in a little more detail in a moment. So on uh, next slide, now I'm gonna look at a few pieces, few of the pieces in depth. Um, and I invite Eric to join in the conversation here as well as we look at some of these. So I've kind of tentatively grouped these into um, kind of some of her landscape pieces. And I think Eric, you had some comments you wanted to share about kind of the process and the openness of her work. Sure. Thank you, uh, Anne, and um, hi, everyone. Um, so uh, yeah, this, this work that you see, especially the sort of the stuff on the, on the right-hand side, seems to be sort of how Anna Maria worked for many years. Um, I worked with her for a few years and have known her for about 15, 16 years. Um, and she always worked in this way where she does like, with a Sharpie was the way she worked primarily and um, kind of this rhythmic sweeping patchwork of color and people and flora and fauna. And um, yeah, it's sort of right to left, kind of upper right to lower left. She always had that sort of rhythm and sort of the iconography that's represented there has been a part of her process as long as I've known her. And then on the sort of the more expansive side of this piece, you see the, the backgrounds that you think actually Sharpie and watercolor and the watercolor is sort of a newer element that she started to use. Um, well, with me and with some other teachers, she started to like expand her vocabulary, her artistic vocabulary slightly to incorporate uh, watercolor. And then eventually when she started working with Victor, it sort of like blew up her, uh, the different types of markings and di different um, things, uh, iconography and things that she would explore really expanded. But um, yeah, we can continue here. Thanks, Eric. Uh, the next slide, this is one of my personal favorites. I'm also, I love bold colors, but I love, there's so many layers to this, the different types. I think there's several kinds of um, acrylic and watercolor and Sharpie and marker included. And I love these clusters of figures that she includes. I, I don't know if you can see as well, but the, you know, they're, these little black groupings are little clusters of figures. Um, and uh, it's just one of the most vibrant pieces in the show. And it's a real celebration of the topography and the culture, I believe. Um, again, Eric, if we were asked Ana Maria what this piece was about, I mean, she would, you, I think you had a yeah. Comment. Most most likely, she would say some something about Peru. And and granted, I have to just say in the forefront, I I have very I know a little bit of Spanish, but not a lot. We and she and I were able to have conversations. And the, the main things that I picked out were landscape, kind of campo, uh, the people, the the flowers. Um, but she would often reference like family in Peru or things like that when she would describe her work. 
And uh, I would just follow up on Anne's comments to say that this, like take from the previous slide to this one, you can see that she's getting a little more painterly, uh, maybe a little more experimental with her process. And um, so, yeah, I think this is a good illustration of her development. Uh, next slide. And here it's, uh, Eric had a great idea because you, the great thing about this virtual atmosphere is you can really dive in and look at an artwork really closely. So we've done that for you because um, you can see the, the large the spectrum of color, but it's so layered. And then so Eric kind of pulled out this one detail. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. Sure. Yeah, I was in the studio last week to pick up some things and I, I was able to look at the show. And um, and as I was looking at, it, I was sort of taking pictures and then I was going through my pictures and I noticed you couldn't really see these details that you could see on the right hand side. And I was like, well, that's essential, I think, to see because you have to it's like you have to be an inch away from Anna Maria's work to really appreciate all the layering and all the marking and the time that and effort that she puts in. And I would say I like this piece a lot because it's sort of, um, it's the culmination of all these different approaches. It's her own organic process. When I started to work with Anna, she had a fully developed process. So I, my, my philosophy and approach was just to stay out of her way and let her go with what she was already um, really good at doing. And I introduced maybe some more colors and watercolor to her but it was always her process. So this sort of incorporates her, her organic process that she developed on her own, sort of the new materials that I introduced her to. And then in the background, th that's actually musical notes that she um, was writing that she started to do with Victor uh, Cartagena. They, they worked together and looked at a lot of sheet music and Anna Maria quickly adapted the iconography from sheet music into her own style and into her artistic vocabulary. So I feel like this piece is a culmination of all her different approaches sort of in one. And yet you still, I wanna point out this one figure in the, in the foreground here. Um, it's kind of a lighter figure there. It's, um, you know, she had the foresight to, to know she was creating that figure even though there's multiple layers on top because it's, it's fully formed and yet it's, you can see it's probably the wash of the color that was the base. And then she's kept it, I know it's a little hard to see probably on the screen, but um, you know, that it's, it's still such a mystery. I know she, she's a, she is a real people person and she loves her family and she's including, but it's it just the way she incorporates some of these figures is just fascinating to me. And it, it just leaves more questions, which I think is to me a signature of really great art, if you will, is when it keeps, you keep asking questions um, and uh, so next slide. Here's another one of those examples of this beautiful wash of color. This was the one we showed earlier. It was paired with another similar colored piece. Um, but again, here you can dive, dive in deeply into the details. Um, and I know Eric, you'd selected this detail specifically. You might want to talk about why. Yeah, well, I just think again, it, it just, I, I don't know, I can't help from the, the previous slide and this slide, I keep thinking of like the sound of music. It's there's something like <laughs> a, maybe a Peruvian sound of music where it's like, sort of like this village or this place and then just the stuff emanating out of it. It's pretty extraordinary. Um, and it really goes, it's such a layered process from, you know, uh, watercolor and then Sharpie and then maybe stuff on top of the Sharpie and then the music sort of over, uh, overtakes everything. And um, just the extraordinary density and the time that she puts into this work, it, it's really special. It's, it's true because even though it's so dense, it still has a lightness to it. It's really open still, even though it's so intense in some areas. Um, uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful piece. Another favorite, there's a lot of favorites here. <laughs> Um, so next slide, I'm going to go a, a next kind of next series, if you will, you know, conversely with those, you know, really multi multicolored and kind of celebratory landscape pieces, there's these kind of isolated figures that she incorporates and these are a real mystery to me. Um, and, um, you know, in this case, this is the smaller piece. This is in the, win the main window. It's 
about 12, 12 by 12, I think. Um, and you can see, I think here, you, even here, the layers, there's some, I'm using my cursor, but I know you can't see that. But in the silver aspect, you can see she's drawn some figures and flora, flora and fauna a little bit, but with silver upon silver. And then again, this beautiful um, kind of negative, negative space that she creates, she doesn't draw a line and then fill it in. She's actually creating that space by this mark making, um, which is a, a true skill as well, I think. Um, and I, I can't wait to hear other people's comments. We'll have some question and answer at the end and we can go back to a few of these if you want um, in, ter in terms of the, uh, the um, her, uh, you know, what this represents to you. It could be either isolating or it could be really like a womb and really comforting. I think it could go several ways. Um, and then this kind of dark slash up at the upper right hand corner is, is kind of, uh, kind of adds another element to the piece. Um, next slide, please. Along the same line of kind of isolated figures, this is not included in the actual physical show, but this is on our artsy exclusive page. And here's another individual piece, um, an individual character. Uh, this one's front and center. This is kind of, usually they're off to the side, it seems like, or not. This is kind of more um, directly in, 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 in the center of the plane. Um, and uh, again, no answers, more just questions. I'm curious to have, hear what other people's questions they have about, or just comments about the work. Um, but just it's kind of it's the shape of these negative these blue figures are quite um, dramatic um, and you can just see her sketch her mo the motion of her sketches you can just see so it's kind of has this fluidity to it um, and then not stagnant even though it's a very static figure in the fig in the middle. Uh, next slide. And then here's, uh, this is kind of the black and white. This is again, as Eric was mentioning before, this confluence of all the, of the media she's using. This the watercolor in the upper left, left hand, kind of this openness. And then there's marker and Sharpie, I believe on the lower hand side. And then these two figures that are included. And again, um, many, many images come to mind, you know, whether that's a landscape or looking over an edge or um, kind of this space, space-like feeling. Um, I don't know, Eric, if you want to add anything to this. We found this in the archives and we just had to include it. It was it's such a beautiful piece. I think it's a stunning piece. It's just a, a really great, uh, just a great artwork. And it, you know, um, maybe I'll speak about it later, but I feel like there's a range of emotions and moods and uh, impressions that you get from Anna Maria's work. And this is definitely sort of that I don't know, moody, dark, uh, maybe isolating feeling, but there's also this this range to joy and music and this vibrancy. So, um, and also I love how it teeters on abstraction and um, and representation. You know, there's a real openness to her work. Yeah, it, I, that's another thing why I, I personally like the work so much is because you keep finding more and more things and it, it's it's opening and it's, you know, it's detailed, but it's also this openness. So the more you stare at this, we can, that could be a fun exercise, just stare at a piece for like 10 minutes and see what you come away with. Um, uh, next slide, please. Uh, and this is, even though it's kind of in the category of isolated figures, because there are a few, but they're always in these little islands, as Victor Cartagena he calls them, the, these islands that she creates where she isolates figures. Um, and in the next set of slides, we'll see where she adds a lot of people in community. But um, this is a quite another intense piece. And um, how long does it take her to kind of work on these, Eric? Like how long would this have taken to complete? Do you <laughs> it's know? a great question. Probably this piece, actually, I think a lot of these pieces were created sort of in two different times, maybe. Uh, maybe not all of them, but, uh, but just in general, probably a couple months or so, uh, mm. something like that, a month or two. And then in certain cases, there was works that were created and then later they were sort of revisited uh, with like new markings. Like once she um, started to do the musical writing, it sort of took over everything. It spread everywhere. Um, 
And would she Again, selectively go back and select a piece to go back and work into it? Yeah, well, we would sort of, some of the teachers would sort of ask her, you know, is it finished? Or maybe maybe you could add some music to this one. And, you know, sometimes she would say, no, it's done. And then other times she would, she would dig in there for another few weeks. Um, but yeah, I think if you just look at the detail, it's, it's pretty extraordinary. It's like that, that could be, you know, it could just be markings. It could be um, music. It could be Farsi writing. Um, it's just, it's so amazing to me. And yet she always, you know, has room for these, again, these negative space characters is the best way I can describe it, where it's not drawn and filled in it's actually opposite it's filled in around it to keep that keep someone it's kind of like this i think of it as like the stained glass window something coming through but um um and then next slide please so then and the kind of the last grouping is where you know we've seen some of her landscapes and the evolution of those and then the isolated figures and then in some cases she she crowds the plane with people um you know, and, and she always has this kind of spectrum of color somehow coming through, it, not always, a lot of times, even though there's a very stark and dark piece, there's so much color and joy coming through. Um, and again, to get to the way to create those figures where you're sketching in reverse almost, or filling in the space in reverse is just incredible to me. <laughs> um, so I, I know I realize I'm boasting a lot, but that's also why I was so intrigued by her work. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, next slide, please. This, um, so in this case, I know I asked, asked one of her teachers, again, Victor Cartini about this in particular, because it seemed like, and he had a great comment about this figure, this in the next piece, which is the red companion piece to this. Um, you know, that she creates, again, these little islands where figures are shown both isolated away from the rest or as a, you know, has a quiet focus to them and then, but also keeping everyone else out in the dark. Um, but he also suggests that she's putting herself away from the rest of the crowd, you know, but any real analysis of this is subjective um, because she doesn't explain it that way. But this, and if you go to the next piece as well, next slide. Um, this is kind of the companion again piece to this where uh, again she concludes these little islands of, of, of folks who are isolated but then there's a huge crowd so she doesn't do many pieces where they're populated they're either more isolated or there's clusters of people so these are a little more unique where there's this range of people included um, and I think Eric you had some comments about that as well yeah I, mean, I felt like when you when we ran through the slides earlier and you made that comment from Victor I was like well that's that's like Anna Maria and we we don't want to read or project too much of her you know meaning uh, onto her or her work but um, I feel like that's a lot like Anna Maria like she she when she comes into the studio she's uh, she comes in she sits down and she gets to work and she's pretty focused and it's sort of this quiet, steady, slow and steady focus. Um, and then she'll sort of participate in the various breaks that we have throughout the day. She'll go to the truck and have lunch. And, um, but she's working. And then at a certain point, it's, it's like she turns a switch and then she's like, so it's social Anna Maria. And so she'll, she'll kind of hover around to the different tables and definitely check in with, uh, she's a big part of the Latinx community at, at the studio. Uh, but she goes to, she, sometimes she'll talk to me like for an hour and I, I don't really understand most of what she's saying, but it's like, it's good. We're just there together. And, you know, when she's got something to say, it's great because she doesn't always speak and she doesn't speak a lot. So when she starts going, it's like, let her go and, and be a receptive audience for her. Uh, so I feel like th this work, and, but she's also, you know, there's the other side, like I was describing before, where she's working by herself. She's, it's like slow and steady and a little bit isolated. Uh, but then she comes back and she's part of the community too. And she's all like, she loves to dance. She's part of the dance party on Fridays. Um, so it's, I, I just felt like his comment sort of alluded to how, who she is a little bit. It's fun. It's fun when you see those connections. I mean, we're not saying it's directly related, but it, it is. You see those connections. So, um, so now we want to. So we want to, especially because um, Anna Marie can't be with us in person on this call uh, or this meeting. Um, 
not meeting, sorry, presentation. <laughs> um, we want to show you a quick video of her work. You know, it does, it, this is about nine years old, I believe, but it does show you, and it was basically focused on her musical notes. So I'll just sit back and let Anna Maria show you her working and then we'll get back. Thanks, Megan, for cueing that. She could have been listening to that song with that. Thanks so much for sharing that, Megan. Um, and that's just a you know a quick one minute clip of uh, again I saw Linda's comment. We I missed that sound too of the studio and the, all that the beehive of activity going on. Um, but that's a little bit about her process. You know, well, nine years ago when she was really working a lot on those musical notes, and as you saw, those those uh, song books were just filled with her 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 mark making. And in this image, she's kind of added some there, but it looks like this is more of a landscape piece here. Um, Eric, do you want to add more, any more comments about her process or? Um... Yeah, I mean, I don't want to take too much time. I sort of alluded to her, um, her process, like how she sort of, when I started to work at Creativity and got to know her, she already had this established process, sort of with the, the landscape and representation and people and flora, fauna, etc. cetera. Um, and I loved it. I was like, it's great. It's perfect just keep going. And that was sort of my teaching philosophy with Anna, <laughs> Anna Maria. Um, and I think she produced a lot of great work um, while I was sort of her quote unquote teacher. And I included her in an exhibition years ago uh, called Repetition. Um, Cause I was just, I've always been a fan of her work. She's a process-based artist, as you saw in the video, it's, it's all about process. It's all about drawing and it's like, it's, uh consistent it's rhythmic it's relentless it's just like it's unstoppable <laughs> it's it's a force of nature <laughs> and um but i just really want to i mean she worked with a lot of teachers pilar olabaria and uh gloria morales uh, paul mosamer um Geraldine montano and um who else? Uh, lisa dorian and uh, myself but when she started to work with Victor, it, it really opened up, Victor Cartagena, it really opened up a new chapter in her work. Uh, initially, I think they were getting to know each other and because Victor speaks Spanish, they, it, there was an immediate connection. And, and, they, and then, you know, there was a sort of a Latin ex community in his area. And so she was immediately part of the community in that particular area. And then just being able to communicate with Victor, I think really opened her up. And so she quickly started to, he had sheet music around uh, for, for other artists and then for himself as well, he's a musician. And she started to work on top of the sheet music. And then after that started to work, you know, mimic the sheet music. And some of that work was represented in the exhibition years ago called Forte. Um, and then, Later, she started to sort of merge the, that the music body of work was sort of a separate thing. And um, she worked on that for years and I'm sure is continuing to do things at home. Uh, but it was after that, that it became interesting to me that she started to pull the different pieces of uh, bodies of work together into one thing. 
And I, I feel like this exhibition really captures those, those moments sort of before she incorporated both bodies of work and then after where it was just became this seamless patchwork of, of different uh, approaches and markings. Um, yeah, I think that that's probably more than enough. Oh, thanks, Eric. I really appreciate, so appreciate your insight into the um, her process and um, again, interviewing all the different teachers who've worked with her. Um, it's really been a joy to learn more about her process and it is, she is relentless and we can't wait to have her back in the studio soon. <laughs> um, I think next slide we have some, we'll just take some time for questions and we can go back to something, you know, an image if someone wants. We have, I don't know, we have a good amount of time for a few questions if anybody has, has any. Um, there was one or two questions that came through on the chat. One in particular um, asks, does Ana Maria use any reference material when creating her work? I think in the video we saw her going over some sheet music, but um, some people are curious about if she references anything. Uh, prior to the sheet music, there's probably source material around, but I don't think it affected her style or her work. Uh, the, this, like the images that's on the screen right now, uh, minus the musical notations, is pretty typical of what she always did. And I, I think it was always uh, in, just from her head. And she's always, it sounds like she's always layered, like always been layering these media. Well, I shouldn't say that because some were just only mark markers at the beginning. Because you mentioned at the very beginning, she also would almost fill the page. Yeah, I think one of the, the figures towards the end of the slideshow was uh, mostly black and then a little bit of blue. And that, to me, that sort of represented a little bit of what she was doing when I, I sort of got to know her. I don't think that she used a whole lot of color. It was mostly black and then a few, maybe a few colors like that. And then it became more colorful and a little more watercolor and then um, and then the sheet music she definitely references. Do we know what inspired her addition to, to use color? It seemed like this kind of burst Probably. in the middle of her of. <laughs> Maybe as simple as there was more markers around. I don't know, <laughs> you know, there's, if there's materials on hand, people tend to, to grab whatever they need and, and start using them. And I think that I, maybe I encouraged it. I don't remember consciously saying, oh, you need more color or anything like that. I think it just happened sort of organically. Um, has Ana Maria ever described any of the figures to anyone? Maybe it's a teacher from CE or a, you know one of her fellow artists. Has that ever come up? I know when I asked Victor that question, sorry to jump in, Eric, I didn't mean no. to. Um, he mentioned she's constantly referring to her family. Um, she doesn't, it doesn't sound like she, at least to him, has indicated this is my mom, this is, you know, my sister or my uncle or something like that, but it's familia. It's kind of, you know, it's, um, and she, it sounds like, you know, she has family in Lima and New York and Spain um, and doesn't, Sounds like, uh, sorry, she talks about all her relatives, but it doesn't say that they're indicated that those are them necessarily. Yeah, I, I agree that it's maybe just generally references people of Peru or family of Peru, or usually to me, I always heard of Peru in there. So I always <laughs> assume that there's some sort of connection with the sort of the landscape and people that are in her life. Great, yeah, and then there was one question at the very beginning just about, and you talked a little bit about Ana Maria um, kind of in this virtual setting and I can maybe help answer this a little bit too because I know she's been kind of intermittently um, participating in programming, but just kind of curious about her practice during shelter in place. Uh, I'll take that. I don't, don't, actually, I don't know. Pilar would actually be able to fill me in a little more about what she's doing. Uh, she, she's not alone. There's quite a few people that have technical challenges. Uh, maybe language is a part of it too, as far as connecting on, on our Zoom classes that we're offering. Um, yeah, I mean, there's just logistical challenges for some people as far as Wi-Fi and uh, technology. 
the things that some a lot of us take for granted. And um, I assume that she's working. I think it, it's probably <laughs> would be helpful for the family that she's working. And I know like Pilar and some other folks are, are checking in with her. So as far as I know, she, she's doing well. Um, yeah. We could maybe see a resurgence, you know, after we send her all the photographs of the exhibition. I mean, she's been aware of it and we've been keeping her in touch when, um, again, her teacher and uh, service provider calls um, to check in, um, but hopefully they'll be thrilled when they see the, the, the images. Um, again, we always try to incorporate the artists, even their choice when doing a solo exhibition. For example, Thomas Pringle's solo exhibition last year, um, he was very involved in the process of selecting, you know, the theme or the, the maybe even some of the works I believe that were incorporated. Um, in this case, we kind of had to make it our choice of which, what to include because they don't have as much, she didn't seem to have as much interest in, in that aspect or communicating that way. But um, again, we really look forward to having her back in the studio when we can, when we can open our doors. And because of um, the limitations and or the, the interest in using technology, she would of course then be one of the artists that we would prioritize who would be able to access the studio once we can make it available because we'll most likely be doing that in a very phased approach where we only have a, you know, a few artists at a time for, um, for safety reasons, et cetera. So we would prioritize those artists who have not been able to use the studio or not, or been able to uh, participate, I should say, in all the numerous, you know, over 22 virtual classes we, we um, feature a, a week. Um, and so we would prior, prioritize those artists. But um, I think this is primarily, a, you know, a, an invitation to just explore the work. I mean, the great thing about, I guess, on the silver lining, if you will, of, uh, of being able to look at artwork only online is you can really dive in and spend a lot more time. A lot more of it's available online, especially Creative Explored. Not only do we have Ana Maria's exhibition online on the Artsy page, which we hadn't been doing as much um, prior to COVID, but now we're putting everything online. So it's really kudos to our gallery team for getting all that uploaded and documented. And there's a lot more process that goes into that, but it's making it accessible to a, a wider audience. and. Um, you know, people can really uh, focus in and delve into the work. So I invite you to spend time with Anna Maria and her figures and, um, you know, hopefully bring light, bring more light and attention to her and her work as well. Yeah. Sorry, were there any other questions? I didn't mean to. No, those were all the questions in the chat. I don't know if anybody wants to come on. Oh, and oh, yes. And then also, um, Clea Massiani, our curator, did mention Outsider Art Fair booth, which will be from January 28th to February 7th. Um, that's included in the chat as well. But did anybody have any questions for Eric or Anne and wanted to chime in and be on camera? I do see one that came in from Kara. Thanks for your oh, thank you. support, Kara, and your question. Um, and says that are we considering a show catalog? Because I do think it was mm. again Eric's point of showing a detail next to the close up that that would be great. Um, don't have any plans for that in the works right now, but um, stay tuned. There are some exciting projects coming up featuring our artists um, in a book platform. So this will definitely be you know um, a possibility in the future. I'll hold it at that. <laughs> a yeah, teaser. Def definitely come visit the studio sometime if you're able when we're back and check out Anna Maria in action. <laughs> if and when she's there. <laughs> she sometimes goes to Peru for like a year. <laughs> and again, thank you all for attending. And please, I think we have the next slide if there's no more other questions. Um, or I didn't mean to, but yeah, just I think we have our, we'll provide our artsy if we haven't already in the chat so you can check that out. Um, this is an actual picture of Anna Maria's hands and you can see this is to bring you back to one how she fills in the page. I found this from a while ago and I just love the pile of Sharpies next to her. <laughs> I imagine her just surrounded by Sharpies and markers and just filling out pages and um, <clears throat> that this is kind of poetic. We can see her in action even though if we can't see her in person. Um, Megan, lots I'll let you of, pull this out. Yeah, lots of kudos coming in. i um, going to stop sharing this screen so we can see each other again. Um, but just want to say thank you again to everybody for joining us. Um, I'm going to also share the link to our Artsy page, but it's here in the chat if you want to open it now and be sure to bookmark it. And 
visit the page, take a look at all of the artwork, and then it actually officially opens tomorrow. So spread the word for Ana Maria Vidalon. So thank you guys so, so much.